you know, my daughter uh, just turned 18 and is off to college, and I just remember when she wrote that song, though, um, you know, just as a dad, this is what you pray for. Uh, you, you hear this song where she's talking about how she's longing to be with Jesus. And, and, and when it's not quite right, then life's just not right. But when I'm right with him, and, and, and you, you know, as, as a dad, as a parent, right, that's, that's your desire. You want that day to come when, honestly, they could live without you. But they can't live without God. Like, if you can get your kids to the point where they totally believe in their head, Dad, I can actually move on in life without you now. You prepared me for this, but I also, I am desperate for Jesus, and I can't live without him. That's the goal. I mean, that's the goal in ministry, right? You, you want your people to be able to have this relationship with God where they're just going to die without him, but they can do without you because you've trained them. You've taught them how to study the word. They, they know how to go out and make disciples. They can stand on their own two feet, but too often we do the opposite. We get people dependent on us, and they can do with or without God, and suddenly they, they move away to another place, and they just go, man, I can't find a church out here. I, I don't know what to do. I miss you. I need you. And what we're trying to do is transfer everything onto Jesus. Everyone falling in love with Jesus, needing him. And, and even as I say that, look, I, I really want you to evaluate your life tonight. And does that describe you, that song where you're longing for him? Man, I know we're all supposed to be, you know, in ministry somehow here at this conference. But seriously, in your heart right now, are you in love with Jesus? Does that really describe you? Because I'm finding it harder and harder to stay in love with Jesus. I just feel like everything's getting busier and busier and time's moving faster and faster. It really hit me just last year. Last year around this time... I was getting ready for a, I, I was really excited because Easter was coming, and Easter usually stresses me out, but last year it didn't because I was speaking at a new place, and that means I could use an old message. And uh, <laughs> so I just went through like my old messages, and, uh, and which is awesome because Easter's like your best messages, so I had like 20 of them. Like, man, which one am I going to use? Um, and I'm going through these messages, but... As I was reading them, I started getting convicted because I read some of the ones that I, I, I spoke in the early days, and I'm going, man, I said that? Like, I'd look at some of the things I said, and I noticed, man, back then, I didn't care what anyone thought. I was just going to say whatever God wanted me to say. I saw this attitude and this courage and this boldness that I had in the early days, and it made me sad because I'm going, God, I think I've lost some of that. I think all the pressure, all the criticism has actually weakened me, and I'm looking at these things I said like 10, 15 years ago, and I'm not saying those same things now. God, help me. I want that boldness back. I don't want to water down your message. I want to say whatever this book says, but I notice it just by reading old sermons. But then you know what killed me was I started reading these old messages, and there was this one. There was this one message where it was, a, it was when my son was born. I, I had already had three daughters, and my son was born that week, and I was describing his birth to everyone in the church because I was pretty excited about it. And and uh, because when, when Lisa was going to the hospital, we, we just go, gosh, maybe we should bring Rachel, our oldest daughter. It's like she was 10 at the time. It's like, that might be cool for her to see. You know, we're going back and forth, like, is it too much? Is it this or that? And finally, it was like, well, let's just bring her. It'll keep her from messing around. And uh, <laughs> so we took her, and... And so she's there. Here's my oldest daughter. Where I, where my wife's about to give birth to my son. And then the doctor looks at my daughter and says, would you like to deliver your little brother? And we're like, she can do that? And uh, <laughs> she's, you know, kind of going, yeah. And so they give her these little goggles, a little gown and gloves. And, and so my son's coming out. I mean, picture all the emotions as a man. 
like your first son. I mean, I love my daughters, but there was something special about, wow, now I'm going to have a man, you know? And he's coming out, and I'm like, we're going to hunt. We're going to kill things. I, you know, it's just all of these emotions, right? And now add to that, you've got your oldest daughter, you know, just the love of your life, you know, and then here's my wife who I adore, and, and this, my son's coming out. Tears are coming down her face as she's catching her little brother. I mean, it was just this insane moment, and I'm reading the sermon as I'm describing that moment, and then at the end of the story, I write, um, as amazing as that was, it paled in comparison to my time with Jesus this week. I had such amazing times with Jesus that I really kind of forgot all about the birth. Like I had these times where I was so intimate with Jesus that I thought, man, that birth was fine, but man, I wish you could have been there. I wish you could have been there when I was just talking to God. We were so close, so intimate, and I was talking to him, and I loved it, and I didn't want to leave. And I remember as I'm reading this sermon, I go, I remember that week. I remember that feeling where, man, it was just so good. I just felt so close to him, and I was just shocked that I was that close to the creator of the universe that I kind of just thought the birth was fine, but this time with Jesus was amazing. And that's what killed me was when I was reading that sermon, I thought to myself, God, I think I used to love you more. And I didn't ever want those words to come out of my mouth. God, I think I used to love you more. And, and, and as I'm just wrestling with those thoughts, you know, I, I, I heard just this verse just kept coming to my head. And I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit just speaking it to me or if God brought it to my mind. It depends if you're charismatic or not. Okay, if you're charismatic, I have heard this from the Lord. And if not, it just came in my head for some reason. Uh, it, it's just... But it was a phrase from Revelation 3.10 where God says, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. It's what he said to that church in, in, in Sardis. He says, you've got this reputation for being alive, but you're really dead. And yet he also says this phrase, strengthen. There's something in there still. Strengthen what's left. And it was a wonderful word from the Lord. I, I just really felt like God was encouraged. It wasn't like condemning. It was just, Francis, I know who you are. I know it's still in you. Now strengthen the back up. I know you're my prophet. I know, Francis, if I told you, just speak to that hymn conference, say whatever I tell you to say. He goes, I know you would do that. I know you would do that for me. And I know that at the core of your being, you love me. You get it. You get what I did on that cross for you. And you've just gotten distracted and all these gadgets in your pocket and, you know, and all these people trying to get at you and you're just doing, doing, doing and you're losing sight of what matters. But I know at the core of who you are, you are in love with me. Now strengthen that back up. Get back to where you need to be. And it's been an amazing year for me to go, you know what, God? I, I am so sorry. I, I think I've gotten weak in this area. I'm so sorry that I think I've neglected my time with you and I've gotten busy with these other things. And when ministry wasn't going well, I just thought I would work even harder and make more stuff happen because I'm so addicted to accomplishing things. And God was just saying, strengthen. Strengthen what remains. Stir up that love again. Get back to your first love. Get back to that courage. And I, I, even thinking about tonight, you know, as I'm praying, I'm going, God, what do you want me to say? Because I'll say anything. I'll say absolutely anything. And, and you know, I, I just start thinking, okay, there's a countdown clock right there. I'm watching how much time I have. 30 minutes, 53 seconds. Sorry if that disappoints you. I still got half an hour. Um, <laughs> but I'm looking at that, and I just start thinking, I go, okay, what if that was a countdown of my life right now? And in 30 minutes and 40 seconds, I'm going to see him. What would I say? Like, what would I say to you where I go, I don't care. I'm not going to see you in 30 minutes ever again. It doesn't matter what you think of me after this. I'm going to face God. 
Like, did you understand? Like, like in a few seconds, I'm going to stand before this being who's sitting on the throne. Where Revelation 4 says there's going to be lightning and thunder and fire. This being who gave me my whole life, and I'm going to stand before him. What am I going to care about at that moment? Am I going to care what you thought about me? Am I going to care about my reputation or the criticism I'll get? And, and so, so what would I say right now if I knew that, if I knew that was happening? Man, I think I would just remind you, you guys, what we're doing here, this is not a joke. This is not a game. This is not just a conference. There's really a being like that in heaven. Man, and so many people don't ever stop and think about what he is like. About the fact that high angels are covering themselves up and screaming out, He's so holy. He's so holy. He's so holy. And, and especially... Man, not to be, not to overgeneralize, but I, I kind of feel like, especially in Hawaii, you know, like we can have such a, what I love about Hawaii is it's so laid back, you know? And, and yet, you guys, there's an intensity about this. It, it's hard to even talk about it with flowers around my neck. I'm sorry, okay? Hope that's not fair. I'll wear it later. But it's just... There's just something about this softening and everything else. And, and I just believe, you guys, all of us, me included, we underestimate what it's going to be like when we see him. We grossly underestimate that, that moment. Okay, and I think if I love you, I'm not just going to, you know, kind of say a few nice words and sit down and hopefully you clap. And this, What kind of love is that? Like, I want to prepare you for that moment and make sure you really get what he is like and go, man, that's cool. That's all that matters. It's all about having a high view of God and understanding who he is. Some of you in this room, man, I know some of you are lying right now about your relationship with God. Some of you, even as I describe that God to you, there's a little bit of fear in you because your relationship with him isn't right. Some of you in this room are having affairs right now. And it's not because your husband isn't doing his job. It's not because your wife isn't doing her job. It's because you have a low view of God. And you have no clue who you're about to face. You have no understanding that he's looking right now. Some of you are addicted to pornography. Why? Because you have a low view of God. You don't understand, man. When the Bible talks about him being holy, it means he's not just another person up there. He's not just another person. Like, if you could see him right now, the Bible says you would die. Like, he dwells in unapproachable light, and at any second, I'm going to come into his presence. Man, and if 27 minutes from now, I were to come into his presence, man, what would I care about? What would I think about? And then I think about, you know, like my family. I go, if I love my wife, then one of my number one duties is I want to prepare her for that moment when she sees God. I want her to be ready for that. I, I, I want to know that, that when Lisa comes before the throne, that God's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. If I love my children, I want them madly in love with Jesus and going, okay, uh, so that God one day will say to Rachel, well done, good, faithful servant. That he would say to all five of my kids, well done, good and faithful servant. That he would say that to all of you. That you understood the urgency of this and you understood who you were about to face. A God who is holy, holy, holy. And, and, and in fact, a couple of months ago, I was at a conference and the guy was reading that passage from Revelation 4. And he was talking about how those high angels, it says in Revelation 4, 8, it says, Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It's like day and night, these high angels, they never stop saying it. And it hit me. I mean, I've read that verse so many times, but it hit me when he said it. Because I thought about, okay, so that's all those angels do. Like right now, that's what they're doing. In heaven screaming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
that even in heaven there is this need to remind everyone in heaven he is so set apart from all of us. He is so distinct from us. He is so far beyond us. And, and it hit me when he was reading that passage. I felt like God was saying, Francis, that's what I've asked you to do on the earth. As the angels are doing this in heaven, I know you sound like a broken record, but you keep telling people, reminding people, like, you don't get it. You don't get how great he is. Man, this has become like a religion to you. You just say the word God like it's no big deal. You say the name of Jesus like it's no big deal. And it's a big, big deal. And when we face him, we're going to realize just how huge of a deal it is. Because he's holy. He's holy, holy. So right now, as the angels are telling everyone in heaven, going, man, you don't get it. You don't get how holy he is. Man, I I believe it's my job here on earth to, to look at you and say, man, I believe this. I believe this God I'm about to face at any moment. Man, he is all that matters. He is all that matters. And to make sure you get that, that's what I would say with my last 24 minutes. My last 24 minutes, I, I want to make sure that you're right and you're ready to come into his presence, that you understand his love, that I'm not saying, man, do a bunch of stuff and get ready for the, the coming of the Lord. No, I'm saying make sure you really have a relationship with him. Make sure you really understand the cross. Make sure you really get that if that being sitting on that throne, that those angels are worshiping him like that, he sent his son to take the form of a man, to die on a cross for us? I mean, do you get that? Do you get how huge that is? I, I mean, I was reading the account in the garden the other day when Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he cries out to his dad going, God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? Any way you can take this cup from me? And I tried to imagine like one of my kids, like, what if Rachel was, was calling out to me like that? Think of your kid. Think about your kid looking at you and, and saying, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Like, Jesus looked at his dad and goes, Dad, I feel like I'm going to die right now. My soul is dying right now. Is there any other way to do this? Is there any way you can take this cup from me? Really? I'm going to go on a cross and take your wrath? Can you take this cup from me? And to be begging me. I mean, what father can look at their kid begging them, sweating drops of blood, saying, is there any other way? Is there any other way? Please take this cup from me. And then finally, Jesus says, but not my will, but yours be done. Three times he begged the father with, with blood, you know, coming out of his pores, going, I feel like I'm dying now. Please tell me there's another way. Take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And for the father, God on his throne, looking at his son, for the father to say in Isaiah 53, 10, after Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done, the father says, it was the Lord's will to crush him. Wait, are you serious? So Jesus is begging the Father, is there any other way? And then Jesus, okay, but not my will, your will. And God looks at his son and says, it's my will to crush you as a guilt offering because I love these people. Because I'm rich in mercy. And I'm a righteous God, and I have to be just and the justifier somehow. Someone has to pay for me to be a righteous God, to be a just God, and yet I'm full of mercy, and I love these people. And so you say, not your will, but mine. And so I'm going to crush you. That's my will as a guilt offering. And, and so for us to casually go, oh, God, thank you for the cross. I go, no way. Do you get that? Have you ever seriously just gotten on your face before a holy God and go, I can't believe you went through that for me. And do you trust in that? Do you believe that with all of your heart? Where you personally have this relationship with him. 
look, just because we're all in ministry somehow, I'm not even going to begin to assume that we're all going to be there. There are many that are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? And he's going to say, I I never knew you. You never had a relationship with me. Some of the people in your own congregation did, but you never knew me. Like you never cried.